Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Dunning. I'm a PhD student here at MIT. Uh, and my day job is actually doing, uh, oh, sorry, it's not working. Uh, it's doing uh, optimization and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and when I'm not doing that, much to my supervisor's horror, I'm doing this, which is uh, playing around with Julia packages and nagging people. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to kind of, uh, I got a, a lightning talk, but I wanted to do a quick sort of whirlwind, hi whirlwind history through uh, Julia and its package ecosystem before sort of saying where we are now and where we're going. Um, so day one, Julia commit number one, initial empty commit by Stefan, was uh, 2009, August uh, 22nd. And then the kind of why we created Julia post was sometime later in 2012. Uh, metadata, so packages did exist uh, in this intermediate time. But metadata itself didn't come into being until uh, November 2012. Uh, and example.jl, which Tony just mentioned, was uh, package number one. And options, text wrap, and arg pass, which are all still around, I guess, uh, were, were right after. And then data frames uh, was in there as well. So data frames has got some history. Uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so Julia 0.1 was released early the next year. And at the time, there were 80 packages in metadata. Um, and this amazing artwork is found in the Vatican. Um, <laughs> truly prescient uh, artists. So 2013, uh, really starting to see a massive increase in adoption uh, and growth of the package ecosystem. So we switched to uh, the metadata v2 branch, which you may have noticed if you've ever been looking at the metadata repository. That happened in uh, October. And I've been damned if I can remember why we did it, but I'm sure there was a very good reason at the time. Something, something was wrong. and. This was our idea to fix it. Um, Julia 0.2 came out in November of that year. And at the time, already 220 packages were available. Um, and then something happened. So what happened is that 0.2 came out, and everyone promptly started working on 0.3. Well, not everyone. Package developers. Users were going, oh, Julia 0.2, the number's going up. I should get it. All well, the package developers were on master straight away. It was, it was, it was, if you think 0.4 is bad, it was much worse then. Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. But the problem is people were not taking care to not break, break their packages on 0.2. So people were doing package.add, your favorite package, and then it would immediately fail. And then I started nagging people. And really, the key to nagging people is to nag them in a systematic way. So <laughs> what I did is I made some code to help me nag. And, and the code is called package evaluator. And it does one thing, and it does it. Uh, I used to do it in a quite a complex way, and I've been trying to make it more and more simple. But essentially, it downloads every package uh, and then runs the tests, or tries to at least, and it does it against Julia release and Julia nightly. And it's doing this every night. Uh, the current setup runs it in a virtual machine. It runs four virtual machines, half the packages for each uh, version running in parallel. Um, and so you can actually set it up on your own machine and test it out. Uh, and if it doesn't work, try and figure out why. Then it takes the results from this and puts them online at package.julialang.org. And then it automatically files issues as things break, kind of. Um, so if you've been, this has been around for about a year now. And I've recently uh, simplified things. So now it'll actually show the version number. So you can have badges for 0.3 and 0.4. And there's now just three real statuses. Before, it was a little bit more complicated. Um, but I won't go into that right now. But now it's very clear. You have tests and they pass. You have tests and they fail. You don't have tests, so I can't really say anything either way. Or it isn't possible to test it on the machine. So if you, uh, for example, need to produce 3D graphics, I can't do that because I'm running in a, a headless virtual machine. This is the, uh, the money plot, I guess. This is like uh, the metadata over time. So this is the number of packages over time. The more solid bars are when uh, at ends of years, so start of years, so January 2013, 14, and 15. And the thinner lines are Julia releases. So 0.1 and 0.12. Uh, 0.11, I believe, was on the same day as 0.12. Something went horribly wrong, if I remember, and had to immediately release a new version. Um, and you can see that the amazing release uh, cadence we've achieved uh, was 0.3. And that's, I think Tony and uh, Elliot have been really driving that, especially. Um. The other thing I want to point out in this plot, apart from the fact that it's roughly linear, is that there's kind of an effect. So what the, the green, the, this funny kind of greenish, bluish color on the left is just from metadata. I don't have my own personal records. 
Everything after that is registered and tagged packages on metadata. Now, you can see a gap between the yellow and the blue lines, and that is because there are some packages that were 0.3 only. So the number of 0.3 compatible packages was higher. 0.3 came out, and I started doing 0.3 and 0.4. The lines come back together. But as you can see in the top uh, right-hand corner, now we're starting to get divergence again. And there's a good number of packages that are 0.4 only. So I take this as a sign as developers getting uh, excited about the new release. <laughs> Now, you might be thinking, linear growth, is that good? Is that bad? Well, I kind of did some research, and I found some websites that track this kind of thing. And this is how we compare to Rust, which is a relatively new programming language. This is how we compare to Rust R, which is CRAN, Haskell, and Clojure. And here's how we compare to Python and JavaScript. So what I would say is that package growth is linear. Uh, unless you are just insanely big. And then maybe they're all actually exponential, but we just can't see it. <laughs> so um, maybe we should think of ourselves as being the blue line, because we can run all the Python packages too, right? So we're doing really good, I think. We've pretty much crushed all these weaklings. So there we go. So this is how we've been going for test quality. You can see on the left-hand side, there's like a bit of a gradient. Um, actually, no, maybe you can't see. Let's go to this picture. So this is the fraction of tests by their status. The green is basically has tests and pass. Blue is like it could load but didn't have tests. Yellow was it had tests and they failed. And red means I couldn't even load it. And then what you can see is that when I started nagging you, you all started fixing your packages because the <laughs> testing package went up. And it kind of hit 60% and it stayed there ever since, um, which means great. 0 0.3 is stable. Uh, packages are stable. 0 0.4. This is relative, so you know, it's been breaking. Um, let's see why. So checked into conversions, uh, regularized dictionary syntax, char no longer integer subtype, that broke JSON. So I switched to running in a VM that kind of made a little wobble there. Jeff just did something very innocuous and made some modules, and that broke bin depths and thus destroyed <laughs> everything. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty, it was like an organization. Redesign of tuples, however, Tupocalypse. <laughs> was a real, like, bam, like, take that, packages, and they haven't ever really recovered. Um, <laughs> and then the hits keep, keep on coming, and it kind of got down to here, and uh, kind of emerged, uh, removed of a 0 0.3 deprecations just, like, quietly, and that was like, please, no more. Um, <laughs> so people have, been, people have been struggling ever since. Um, so I've changed to a new system, but I've now removed the... the, the the orange line, and you can see the new status is the numbers kind of changed a little bit relatively, but otherwise. Uh, finishing up now, we know we're in a kind of amazing state where we have a lot of packages and they're all building on each other. This monstrosity that you can't read is the package dependency graph for Gadfly. That's Gadfly at the top, that's Compat at the bottom, and that's everything else in between. Um, this one is Quant Econ, I've chopped off Compat. Um, you two, we had to make these soon as I tag new versions of metadata tools and graph layout, my other side projects. Um, but this is pretty cool, I think. This means we're a community, I say, um, and we're working together. We're working together in a variety of ways. Organizations to organize us. These are some of the logos for the uh, organizations that are um, on metadata. Uh, if you can name them all, I will give you a handshake. Um, <laughs> About 20% of registered packages belong to an organization. Um, so they're a big factor in, in Julia's package world. Um, so finally, just some future thoughts, thoughts on uh, what we're doing here. So technically, uh, technical stuff, you know, I think more package metadata is needed, at least keywords or some kind of discoverability mechanism. And there's also been some discussion in a couple of places about adding kind of an, an options file to control how you appear on package.julialang, to control how coverage.jl works. Um, there's also you know, neat things we could do. Since we're downloading every package every night, what can we learn about the packages since we're already doing that? Like you know, pull out all their exported names so you can search the documentation at the REPL, for example, pan ecosystem searching. The package website can always add more features. Um, Socially, uh, I think we need to decide what it means to be in metadata. We have not decided, and we don't have to necessarily formally decide, but I don't think a consensus has been reached. Um, so should metadata be like a more walled off thing where there's a quality control, 
or should it be a free-for-all? Um, we have no namespacing. Packages are all together. Uh, you know, only one name. You know, if you want to share a name, you can't. So that's actually quite common, but it's not inherently the right thing to do. Um, and we need possibly some more better processes about abandoned packages and deprecation. Because did you see on the, the 0 0.3 how it flatlined at 60% passing? My, my theory is that there's like a good 20% of packages that are like abandoned or something like that, and they'll never pass again. And when we hit 0 0.4, it'll now be like 30% of packages that have been abandoned and never passing again, as more and more get kind of killed by entropy. So do we want to keep those around forever, or do we dispose of them? Uh, and I'll see you next Julia Khan at 1,000 packages. Uh, submit some PRs, people. Come on. <laughs> Any questions about package evaluation systems? Yep. Uh, for how long do you think you're going to be able to keep up downloading all the packages every night? Right? Is that going to be sustainable for a while? It seems to be. Like, so since I paralyzed it, it's taking on the order of maybe like three, four hours. Um, so yeah, and some of, those, some of it's some, a small number of packages take up a lot of the time, which is, suggests that you know, if a need be, we could sort of triage that and yeah. So, pretty confident. Yeah. What do you think about the idea that I've sort of been uh, pondering of requiring passing? Like, you, you submit that you would like to have a new version of your package or whatever. Yeah. Like package, new version of the package. Um, and instead of testing after the fact, test beforehand. Yeah. Have that be a key way? See, sense? I like it, but the question is is that what metadata is, or should we make a curated metadata and metadata is a free-for-all? Because I think there needs to be a free-for-all type thing just to get, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, we could have, I think that there needs to be an alternative to like the, the, the sort of curated thing. And if it is curated, we need to make sure we're kicking things out that fail to be curated. Yeah. And that's a... Does it even make sense to version things that are just in the free-for-all? At that point, it's like... Literally. Right. That's exactly right. But I mean, a centralized place for them is something that will inevitably have, have to happen, I think, or will be created. But yeah, it, it's definitely an appealing thought to me, but I think it's like anathema to some people. So yeah, like node people. So if that's how you get to 150,000 packages. You make 500 packages to do uppercasing of strings, and none of them are right. As I'm sure Scott will tell you, they've probably got some Unicode problems. So <laughs> yeah, all right. OK, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Thanks.